by uh, um, thinking of what I did back in uh, some years ago, shall we say, which is my own doctoral studies, where I, I was um, seeking, it wasn't an education topic, I was seeking to understand the concept of self and uh, self-knowledge is, is a key part of that was was, was where I ended up um, as, a, as a conclusion. Um, and I, uh, I wanted to hang on to something that was uh, one of the insights of Rene Descartes, um, actually from the 17th century, um, in, in the discourse and the method, then he um, talk, talks about um, uh, establishing uh, something special about his, uh, his knowledge of his self um, in the order of my perception is the way he puts it, um, um, rather than the order of the truth of the matter. So this is um, as, as, uh, the, the superscripted numbers in my title at the top um, are, are linked to. So the, the, the first one is the order of knowing is, is, is the way I, I put it. And the, the second one is the uh, order of being. So in, in the meditations, then he wanted to um, move from the order of my perception, which had established in the discourse and the method, uh, to the order of the truth of the matter, um, that um, not only do I have a special sort of uh, understanding of a bit better, special sort of self-knowledge, but also that um, that that entailed there was some sort of special substance as well. He called it spiritual substance or the soul um, that existed. So that, that he, he claimed to prove the ontological point as well. And I didn't want to follow in, in, in that second step. Um, but, um, but to hold on to the first step and, and hold on to the importance of, uh, of thinking epistemo epistemologically. Um, so uh, um, I'm, I'm trying to promote the importance of epistemology. And not that um, ontology isn't important, but, um, but, but they, 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 they have to go together and, and you can't forget one side of them. Um, in terms of the relation of them, then uh, I find it useful to, to go back to um, uh, how Plato uh, sets them up as as, as um, different types of thing. This isn't his formula, as commentators have interpreted, of saying that, that knowledge is is, a, is equivalent to justified true belief. And so, you know, what's true is uh, is the ontological component, and, and uh, belief and knowledge are the epistemological components. Uh, and mainly, Plato is interested yeah. in uh, in what, um, since Gilbert Ryle, we we refer to as knowing that that is facts or statements that are propositions which are either true or false things that we believe and we find out they're true and we've got good reason for it that's the justified bit and then that's means we have knowledge and knowledge is something that's true um and uh if, if i can um refer back to uh to tessa's talk last month i, I apologize again for not being there but i had a look at the recording and in, in the discussion this came up as can you can you separate these two out very easily? And um, it, was, it was Ron Barnett I mentioned Roy Basco. I was very keen that they are kept separate, and I guess I'm following him in that respect. Uh, Basco, that is. Um, so the first part of my talk is is, is going to um, look at an example of of uh, where ontology is, ontology is important, but where it's it's um, still separate from epistemology. They're separate from each other. Um, with uh, knowing that as, as the, the type of knowledge I'm interested in. The second part, we'll, we'll look at um, the second in that list of uh, post-royal categories, knowing how, which is linked to concept of, uh, for example, skill. Um, there's a third category of knowledge called acquaintance as well, um, which I'll mention briefly in that part as well. And the third part of my talk, the final part, um, right at the end, will be returning more to knowing that, but it's on the the uh, possibility of discovery, as in like scientific discovery. So that that's the structure. Um, so if you ever visit the University of Liverpool uh, website, you might see this iconic image. It's the it's the Victoria Building. It's the um, referred to as the original red brick building. It's the the original building, the sort of foundation of the University of Liverpool campus. It's still there. Um, and the Liverpool's one of its sort of uh, monikers is it's the original red brick university. Um, the term the term red brick uh, applies to universities of the age, late 19th century, early 20th century foundations. Um, civic, civic universities, they're also called the Liverpool, Leeds, Manchester, Sheffield, Newcastle, Birmingham. Um, and uh, a lot of them, the buildings and the original buildings that use this sort of color brick. And one answer the question, what's, what's the ontology of the university? Well, Bricks and mortar is often a phrase used to for, for campus-based universities, uh, other building materials. That, that has to be part of that picture. It's not 
not that I'm saying that's that's all that we, we should say about the ontology of biodiversity. Um, I can give you a little bit of a uh, you know, geographical um, orientation here, and it's, it's a map of uh, Liverpool. On the top right of this, this map is the uh, northwest of England, and the, but most of this map is North Wales. And I want to take you to so that's Liverpool on the top top right uh, to the bottom left here, which is uh, the end of the Lynn Peninsula. Um, and, and there's a beach here called Hell's Mouth. And uh, I uh, picked up these pebbles uh, on that beach when visiting, uh, put a bit of water in them to bring out the colour a bit more. So the question would be, you know, what are these things? That's a sort of standard uh, ontology question. Uh, formed in the Earth's crust by uh, geothermal processes and, and another movement. Broken off and, uh, and into the into the sea, washed around in the sea, smoothed and smoothed down to smaller size. Uh, that would be a sort of story about what these things are. Um, and uh, that's them in situ. This is the beach. They see the waves coming in at the top. Um, not a bad weather day, this one. Though. Uh, I think this is the prevailing weather, uh, this beach. Um, and then there's, there's um, a sort of larger object in the foreground there. Let's take a closer look. Um, is this just one of those pebbles? Is it... Um, uh, or stone at least that's uh, been formed in the earth's crust and broken away and been smoothed by the sea. Um, well, it it, um, it could have been that, but um, it, it also looks a bit like bricks, doesn't it? Um, with, with the mortar in between a collection of bricks that's broken off a wall. Perhaps it broke off the Victoria building at the University of Liverpool and uh, sort of fell into the River Mersey estuary, swept out to sea and the currents took it around to West Wales. That, that could be a sort of if you were doing a um, research project on what happened to this object, uh, a positivistic sort of story um, of, of what happened to it. Um, that's relevant. So I, I connect this part of the talk with, with research methodology, um, but uh, I want to concentrate on the ontology aspect of it. And, um, and that's a, a spectrum of, of uh, relative realism, I call it. The spectrum goes from realism to anti-realism, which is the contrast that was introduced in the uh, modern um, Anglo-American analytic philosophy uh, in the 20th century. And it's um, it has different different uh, sort of, uh, descriptions and different contexts, but uh, the one I'm interested in is, is sort of to, 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 to get a sense of uh, the, the type of thing a thing is, how dependent is it on us? And that's the answer is more or less. So if it's less dependent, then that's something that hasn't been formed by us or intended by us, uh, relatively speaking. And um, so you can think of the brick, uh, the, the pebbles, uh, anything, if anything physical is made up of atoms, molecules, compounds, and so on. Um, and that's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that description of it. That's the relatively realist or us independent description of what it is. But there are levels of, of, of uh, describing what it is, and, and uh, in the case of bricks, then um, uh, they're also designed and manufactured by by humans. Uh, put the right materials together, uh, put it in the right furnace with the right temperature, and, and you form it into the physical content and shape that it is. Um, so that's a, a design. So there's some something about us, our intentions that go into that describing what it is. That's sort of bricks coming off the production line. And then, then there's a, a, another level with, with further human input, as it were, which is what, what the bricks used for, such as building a certain sort of building. Um, uh, I use this example to sort of try and steer people away from the contrast between subjective and objective, which uh, a, a question that's a question begging uh, dichotomy, because it says it's objective in what way, subjective in what way. Um, it's uh, it, it didn't, it's got something of us in it, um, our intention, both creation and and, and for the purpose. But it's 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 always still a matter of fact. Uh, is it a brick or is it not? Um, and that's not a subjective truth, as a, a phrase I've often seen written in, for example, um, uh, doctoral thesis chapters on methodology, which sort of at, at best it says, well, what do you you know begs the question, what do you mean by it? And it's not always a helpful phrase. Um, it is a matter of fact, whether or not anyone knows it, that it's a brick or it's not a brick. And that's that's my point there. Um, okay, so there's, here's an, the ontology question again. What's this? Uh, um, you 
you might recognize it you may, you may not depending on how much you follow the the, the recent history of art um, it's Carl Andre's equivalent eight, or the, the tape bricks, as they were known when they were exhibited uh, in the 1970s and caused a bit of a, a fuss about being a waste of space and so on. Uh, not worth going to see. Um, but uh, that, that's the evaluation question that we're doing. When we do ontology, we do a classification question. And this is um, where uh, G George Dickey's um, theory of the definition of art I find useful. I've actually used it in a different context to, to consider what the definition of academic practice and a little uh, a journal article there on that matter um but he he uh, created this this theory about how to define art um meaning it to be about art particularly so he says a work of art in the classificatory sense is an artifact the set of aspects of which so conferred upon it the status of candidate for appreciation by some personal persons acting on behalf of a certain social institution called the art world um, the, so it has to be an artifact and, and then something else happens as well to, to this object for it to be art. Uh, but just on the, on, on the conferral aspect, and then he actually, he, sort of an, he says it's analogous to, for example, the conferral of status of, of uh, um, being a bachelor, master's or, or, or doctorate, um, doctoral, uh, successful doctoral candidate. Uh, um, so you've done your, you've done your thesis, it's a, uh, amazing piece of work the examiners like it final version at least um they say it's, it's it's a doctoral standard and you deserve to be called doctor but even when you've been examined you, you're still not a doctor some university committee or bureaucratic process in the university has to rubber stamp this and actually does the conferring of the status of doctorate doctor on you um before you you can be called a doctor so is, is that that sort of idea a, a sort of another another human decision-making process on top of everything else. Um, he says, this is what happens with, with art. Um, and uh, it's sort of examples he's, he's got in mind. Uh, this is um, uh, Mountain by Marcel Duchamp. Duchamp was a, a, a dadaist. And um, he, uh, well, it is, it's, it's, it's not uh, anything but what it looks like. It's a, a gentleman's a urinal which um, he placed an exhibition, or rather the exhibition manager let it be exhibited. So uh, one of Dickie's main points is that not every property or quality that something has is salient. You, you can see it um, directly with, with your, your five senses. So with this, you know, it's the colour, the shape, um, touch of it. Uh, but there's non-salient properties as well. So the fact that it was it was sort of given the conferral of status, as he would call it, by the exhibition manager to be exhibited in an art exhibition. Um, that, that's the non-salient property, and, it, and that's the one that also makes it an artwork. I mean, you might disagree. Uh, that's, you know, this is just isn't an artwork. It's just a, a bit of a joke. But um, it, it, if it is an artwork, that, that's the process that um, makes it so. That, that, that's his point. And once that's happened, there's a, again the question: but the difference between epistemology and ontology um, it's been made an artwork if, if this process is, is the way that artworks are, are finally decided to be artworks but there's another question whether the next person coming along knows it is or not um, so that's what, how the knowledge question is different um, so going back to my spectrum of uh, more or less realism or anti-realism then uh, um, what what we have still, you know, with with uh, Fountain, uh, for example, is still, still a collection of types and molecules and compounds. Um, it's been shaped by manufacturing process. Uh, that's the second stage. Um, physical physical content and shape as we, we see it. Um, then the third level again is, is what its purpose. So it's originally designed to, to be in a, a gentleman's public laboratory, and um, uh, whereas uh, uh, perhaps like with uh, Rodin's Le Penseur, then then maybe that always was originally meant to be a sculpture uh, and nothing else uh, shaped to be like that. Um, but then we have a fourth level here. It's it's more anti-realist still. It's more us dependent. In other words, that there's this idea of the conferral of status. Someone has to do an additional act, which is to confer status. So there's a lot of human input shall we say into 
if, 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 if uh, Duchamp's fountain is an artwork, there's a, there's a lot of human input at various stages uh, that make it what it is. Um, so when, when they were doing it, then they knew what they were doing it and while well, they were doing it. But it's, it's about, about the rest of us, the next person that comes along and says, well, what is this? They, they don't necessarily know yet. So it's an objective matter of fact. It is an artwork or it isn't an artwork. I'm not saying one way or the other, but it's still a matter of fact. And there's a, a separate matter who knows that or, or doesn't know that. So, uh, in, t in, t in terms of this, the, what part of my point is is uh, that um, however much human input there is in something, um, it, 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 it's still the question of, of, of what we know, what is true, a, a separate. Okay, back back to uh, to my uh, formula for Plato for knowledge, but I'm going to move on to uh, the, the, the second item in the post royal classification, which is knowing how. Um, so that was less Plato's concerned. Uh, Aristotle had a, uh, an even more sophisticated range of types of knowledge, which uh, could have um, linked to this, but I'm keeping it simple by just having the three knowing that, knowing how an acquaintance. Um, and um, so we would sort of leave Plato now, but uh, for knowing how, then um, that, that's sort of linked to the sort of idea of uh, being able to do something, something practical, the concept of skill comes in here as well. Uh, so Gilbert Ryle himself, um, he, he was he promoted the idea of knowing how as the, as the main sort of knowledge, and that he thought knowing that ultimately was was just part of knowing how, reducible to knowing how in some way. You know, until you know how to do something, you can't claim any knowledge that either. So this, this is um, opposite to. Uh, to um, the, uh, sort of uh, a group in philosophy who call themselves intellectualist views or promoting intellectualist view of knowing how, which is the opposite way around. Um, that that uh, knowing how is reducible to knowing that. In other words, to know how to do something, P knows A, person P knows how to do A, just means person P knows that W, where W is the way to achieve that A, that action. Um, you, you describe it, you describe the steps, you can understand the steps in, in themselves in general terms, and therefore you know how to do it. <laughs> well, and, uh, yeah, I, I'm not convinced by that myself. Um, I don't think um, one's useful for the other. I think they're both, they're each of the se they're each are separate types of knowledge, knowing that and knowing how. Um, and uh, because we want to describe in, 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 even in the most detail how to do something doesn't mean you actually can do it if you're made to do it. That's why, that's why it's separate. So now know how is something separate. So again, there's um, maybe something about the English language here, which causes a problem. Um, you have this, this sort of high hyphenated uh, compound word, know how, or just knowing how, but it, it's ambiguous whether we're in referring to being able to describe how to do it or to actually do it. Whereas this this distinction is is more clear in, in German and in French, which I've got the the, the words for here. So in, in German, wissen wie is uh, you, you know how to do it. You can describe how to do it, but but können, can you kern in it? Um, uh, can you actually do it? That's an, another matter. So that that's clear in French and German. And then those uh, with, with other languages, uh, particularly native languages, um, you have to think about you know how this cashes out in in, in your own. Uh, language as well, other uh, languages. So I'm certainly interested in that. So um, the the the, uh, the the idea of knowing how um, I, I, I sort of also draw from uh, Dreyfus and Dreyfus uh, five steps of, of of learning development from novice to expert. Um, it's sort of knowing how to do things better. Is that all those steps from a starting point? Um, and and as, as you learn to do it something better, then uh, um, you start to uh, be able to do it without needing to think so much about is that sort of idea of uh, you know having to stop and think uh, what do I do next? You just know know what to do next. Um, and um, this is often referred to as as um, as tacit. It's not sort of uh, you know think about it in in, in terms of words. You need you don't concentrate on it either it, it's come second nature that sort of idea 
Now, um, what, what is this tacit is, is my next question. And this is where I'll bring in uh, Michael Polanyi. But before I do, then uh, later the influential thinker, um, more recent influential thinker, Michael Aero, um, he, he uses the term tacit knowledge. And I don't think he's the first person to use it, uh, but it's in the title of this, this journal article I've cited here. Um, and it um, this this would link back to Tessa's talk again. That this is this idea of nominalization uh, is, is the way she referred to it, making knowledge into a noun, nounification perhaps, or turning into a noun phrase, when perhaps that's misleading and, and it should be thought of as simply a noun, because this term tacit knowledge and and, and this is the way that a lot of people in the literature it's been more commonly talked about in the context of uh, vocational education and training, but it's talked about as like a sort of thing, um, sort of stuff, uh, the, the knowledge that's essentially tacit. So that if you have it, then you 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 can't talk about it because it's tacit. Um, if you if you have it, then you can do the things that it enables you to do. But then it's the knowledge itself that's that's tacit, and, and that's that view of, of tacit knowledge is is misleading. I don't think Michael Ever really thinks that, but he, he still uses the phrase. So um, what is the correct way? Well, so this is where um, plan is useful. I think I have seen the term tacit knowledge in his text somewhere, but mainly he doesn't use that phrase. He does talk about tacit knowing, a tacit dimension to knowing. Uh, and, and that makes things so much more clear, I think, if we, if we go back to Polanyi. Um, I mean, first of all, um, is a, we need to make a distinction clear about um, knowing that if knowing how to do something, then learning how to do it. Uh, that, that's clear in his writing. Um, so we bear that, that in mind. Is it the already knowing stage or is it the yet to be knowing stage? Um, but then what, what doesn't come out in, in most of the literature about tacit knowledge in, uh, that I've, I've mentioned is, is there are at least three different types in, in Polanyi's uh, account of this, uh, the categories of the tacit. The first one is perhaps the most obvious it's um what's um it, it's in his phrase um it, uh he, he puts it is 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 that we can, we know more than than we can tell and it's sort of telling something is using words um so articulating it and codifying it that's that's a sense of the explicit um versus the inarticulate or practical which is the tacit that's, that's the, this is the first distinction um and uh some things you know you you do rather than say or there's another question you know, how much can you also say about what you're doing at least uh, in reflection afterwards but anyway that's that's the first um distinction of, of tacit versus explicit or the way around explicit versus tacit in my representation here the second one is i think even more important for polanyi but gets overlooked uh more and this is what, what's the focus of your attention what are you focally aware of that's the explicit um, versus what's um, in, only in your subsidiary awareness. So it's like a shift of attention. Um, that's that's what he's getting at there. Uh, and, um, and that's a that's a separate question to whether you're using words or not. That's why it's di different. There's a third sense, which is uh, explicit versus hidden. It's a hidden, he prefers to use the word hidden with this. Um, rather than tacit, uh, which is, he links to uh, discovery, that's some um, scientific discovery, and I'll come back to that right at the end, the, the final part of my talk. Um, anyway, the, the, the two texts that he uh, draw from of his uh, the quite long book, Personal Knowledge, and then the book's written more, or it's written up as a, a series of lectures he gave, which he wrote up and more uh, public lectures, which are uh, a collection, a collection called The Tacit Dimension. Okay, so um, to to um, explain the first two, then I'll come back to the third at the end. As I said, the first two dichotomies or distinctions, and the first one, uh, explicit versus tacit. So it's um, you know, discursive is a, is a, it's another term for using language uh, versus non-discursive, basically. Um, I think a lot of um, our experience is basically non-discursive or, or non-linguistic, and uh, Robert Kirk. Um, or modern day philosopher uh, uh, just wants to describe what goes on in our consciousness and um, 
he refers to it um he's not the first to to, to, to use this idea but raw feeling it's, it's sort of the how it, things appear to us hit us straight away before we've applied in language to describe it and one of one of the problems with with the language is that it's always too general our experience is too rich and, and language can't capture it um and, and raw feeling is is sort of before it's been sort of processed by linguistic concepts and other terms that's the sort of idea but, but we we have it we have the experience as raw feeling um uh, but it's non-discursive um the, the other second distinction there is the explicit versus tacit is the the one about you know, what are we focusing on what's the focus of our attention um and uh in terms of uh I'll give an example of that at least I've, I've got some slides with a number of examples which we can come back to in, in discussion but but I, I shouldn't um uh, dwell too long on each one but one of them is um playing a piano and um example I'd actually so give this quotation for you uh, from from personal knowledge he says subsidiary awareness and focal awareness are, are mutually exclusive the pianist shifts his attention from the piece he's playing to the observation of what he is doing with his fingers while playing it and then he, he gets confused and may have to stop so when, when you when you, you know how to play the piano you're confident you focus on on the music such as the, the score um and, and uh, focus on that and not your fingers if you turn your attention to fingers on the keys then you, it all goes wrong that's that sort of idea it's a shift of of attention um the focus of attention so when you're focusing on the music you, you nonetheless are aware but only subsidiarily of, of, of what your fingers are doing so that's sort of tacit knowledge tacit knowing so i'll, I'll, I'll skip this I've got an example of swimming uh learning a language knowing a theory but generally having a, a project you're trying to to uh to do in the world but I'll, I'll move on to um a, a question about and this goes back to the nominalization or, or noun making the question um and it it's a, a question that i pose to us now can we talk of being skilled at thinking or intellectual work so linking, linking it more to what we seemingly do at universities for example uh, are there thinking skills? Well, I think, I think Plan, you might agree with the um, with me uh, to answer yes to the first question, but turning that into the noun skill, that, that's where problems start. Um, and it's the wrong way to, to think about it. And um, the, 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 the wrong way to think about it feeds from what I call the argument from realism and also from specificity. But I, I'll, I'll skip the second one. Uh, and talk about the argument from realism. This is realism in a sort of spectrum of, of real to non-real, which is slightly different from the realism, anti-realism one I introduced earlier. Um, uh, the extreme end of realism, which I call naive real realism, uh, it, it, it um, has a view that the things that really exist are sort of solid things, uh, uh, the most reality, um, and uh, some things are aren't a skill. So by bricks, they're not a skill, but they're a thing. Other things are skills, but the skills are still a sort of thing in the same general ontological category. And um, this is an, uh, an this is an ontological mistake about how, how skills are at least uh, um, what what they are. It's an error which uh, Christopher Winch I think correctly attributes to Adam Smith. That sort of the the manual labourer um, is someone who's doing me something mechanical themselves. In, indeed over time it will be replaced by machines um and and the the skill they have in in in, in doing the manufacturing or making something is like an extra body part it's almost this sort of metaphorical at least but it's that's the what the sort of sort of thinking that, that Adam Smith and his followers had and it's had a, a big effect on the way uh particularly um English philosophers of vocational education have thought and I and Chris Winch think that's the wrong way the way I put it is in terms of it, the contrast is, is what I call the other extreme irrealism. Um, there's no entity that is a, is a skill. Skills aren't entities in this way. And it's a sort of, the problem is, is the way in English, at least, that we, we use language. We like to use noun words for this sort of thing. So to say person P has a skill X, what that really means is P is skilled at doing X. So a couple of pieces are written which explain this in different contexts one of them is research degree supervision 
Uh, another one is comparing different levels of, of, of education and the use of the word skill in, 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 in describing it. Um, so it's turning the noun phrase into an adjectival phrase. That, that's what has to happen. So we've got a few targets here who are called naive realists, um, Jink, Maskell and Ian Robinson. Um, they, they say uh, the work of the university is just thinking. Well, maybe it's a bit more than that, but OK. Certainly thinking is central to it. Master of any subject. It's the same as mastering its particular modes of thought. OK, um, learning at any level higher than the three R's cannot be either a skill or a set of skills. You know, skills are just about mechanical stuff, physical stuff. Um, Stephen Johnson, um, yeah, he says, placing thinking on the firmly on the side of know-how also seems inappropriate when it's remembered that to have mastered a skill usually means to be able to exercise it without thinking. He actually uh, talks about riding a bicycle, um, which is one of Lanny's examples, and, and playing the piano and, and thinking about where your fingers are ruins your performance. And, and he says, you know, don't think, just do. You know, thinking's something else. Doing is not about thinking. But of course, so that, that's if you're a competent piano player. But if you're learning how to do it, you do have to concentrate on where you put your fingers the first time you try and play something. So Johnson's uh, missed the point there, certainly Polanyi's point. And Frank Prady, I'll just read out the, the, the last sentence of this, uh, sorry, the second last sentence. Um, it, it is not a, uh, think, thinking, this is critical thinking, is, is not a skill like riding a bicycle, which one learns and then possesses for all time. And rather it is a disposition that grips the mind in certain circumstances. I'm not sure what he means by that last sentence, but it's, it, about the skill being like riding a bicycle, so critical thinking can't be like that. Not 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 a not something you can be skilled at. Um, and uh, the final example is, is is someone who isn't a realist is, is Ronald Barnett, who's uh, one of the authorities on critical thinking and its place in higher education, as as we know. Um, he's, he also notes the sort of question of, of is it a noun or is it should it be more adjectival. Uh, anyway, he's got sort of levels of of, uh, of attainment, I suppose I call it. Um, critical thinking skills is is, is mastering techniques, you know, knowing how to find fallacies in, in arguments, that sort of thing. But a bit of contextual, uh, critical thought, and then critical being, um, where he actually sort of you know competently, proficiently, even uh, being critical, doing critical things in the world out there, um, and yeah. That's, that's the sort of highest level. There's nothing wrong with thinking of it that way. I mean, my own view is to think of it a different way. That it, I'd rather think of this as, as critical thinking and being skilled at it. But it, the thing about being skilled at something is it can be less skilled or more skilled, and it's about learning how to do it better or, or being more skilled at it. So critical being really is just more highly skilled critical thinking in, in, in the language I prefer to use. And um, and this this goes links back again to the question of uh, the relation between epistemology and ontology. If, if we concentrate just on the being aspect, then, then we risk losing the, the knowing aspect, knowing how to do it, knowing how to be a better critical thinker, for example. And um, linking this to um, the academic job in the round, then um, the sort of sense in which it's sort of valued so much by those who make a career out of it, that they, they think of it as sort of consuming all of them, all their being, at least what they value. Uh, who they are rather than what just what they do um which is a, which is a, which is a problem i think because um we shouldn't identify ourselves with any role i, I draw from jean paul Sartre from that philosophically but also cite here uh, um just to remember i gave a talk at the last society for research into our education conference in december um practically speaking and it risks sort of being too consumed and overworking and that's one of the explanations for why academics uh, they're not always forced to but they, they do sometimes forced to but they want to overwork anyway so that's the problem so in, in, you can sum that aspect up from onto the final part of my talk and um uh it, it, just because you can't articulate it or it's difficult to articulate what you're doing um it doesn't mean that it's it's because it's your being and that's all there's to say about it it's because you, you know how to do it you know how to do it well um and uh but, but knowing how isn't just about explanations which would come more in, in propositional form like knowing that so it's still knowledge not just being 
Um, so the final part of my talk now, um, which uh, brings back Polanyi, and this is this third sense of tacit versus explicit. Um, and I kind of understand, you know, how, how research works, uh, research which tries to capture the possibility of, of uh, discovery. And scientific discoveries is sort of paradigm of this, but it should work in other disciplinary areas as well as science. Um, so the explicit is, is something that has been discovered and understood as well, made clear. Uh, it was a tacit is, is something which, which it hasn't got to that stage yet. Uh, Polanyi himself um, actually uh, draws from Plato's paradox of learning for this. This is a, in the Mino, and uh, Mino's slave boy is, is, is taught quite a Pythagoras' theorem um, by, by Socrates. And um, uh, Plato's paradox is, is if you don't know something, then how will you recognize it as something to, to learn and to come to know you know, if you don't, you don't know what it is already? And he says, well, the answer to my paradox is, is we do know it's already, it's in us already. And, and what's happening in the Mino is, is a sort of process for making it clearer to the, to the slave boy that he, he knows Pythagoras' theorem already. And uh, Polanyi uses this um, in, a, in a different way. It's not about knowledge in us, but it's about knowledge uh, we sense is out there. That's the way you put it. So the, this, this, this tacit knowing of something that hasn't yet been discovered. You, you, you sense there's something there and you, you feel your way towards it. This is the language he uses and, and it becomes gradually clearer. Um, you don't understand it initially, but you come to understand it better. Um, and then it can, becomes explicit and you can say, this is my discovery. Um, that, that's how he describes it. Um, to, to understand what's really going on here, then I think we need to go back to Immanuel Kant and his distinction between the phenomenal and the noumenal. Now, the, the noumenal, noumenal objects are, are things as they appear, the, the world that we know, phenomena we can describe, we know them. And there's a, but there's a limit to that because we're only finite beings, we're not omniscient. And so he says, out, maybe there's an outside of that and you know, things we don't know uh, in the same way, at least. These are things in themselves, he calls it, or the noumenal. Um, because I'm referring to something similar as well in the Tractatus. Uh, critics of Kant on this, uh, Peter Strawson in, in the 20th century, also um, Hegel as well. But they want to apply um, Occam's razor that you shouldn't multiply entities beyond necessity. And in this case, to explain something, you just don't need both of these things. If you lift, this is Hegel, if you lift the curtain of appearance in front of the super sensible, which is his term for the noumenal, yeah, you know, you're just hiding something initially and you you, you uh, and reveal it, then it's the same sort of stuff as, as what's in front of the veil, the curtain. Um, I think that's too quick. Hey, um, I think Hegel needs the distinction for his own philosophy. Lord Neilsley thinks he does. Um, Graham Priest is sort of Hegelian in certain ways, um, uh, uh, in a 20th century philosopher, the Anglo-Analytic tradition. Um, <clears throat> Uh, actually tries to explain what Kant's trying to do in terms of a, a torn boundary thesis, he calls it. So the, li the limits of, of, our, of our knowledge, our experience, of our thought. Um, if you think of all the things we think, then is that you put a boundary around that. And he, he, he uses it um, to illustrate it through using sort of Venn diagram or sets, uh, illustrations of sets uh, to explain what's going on. So here's an example of two sets, a set of all people in the world, a set of all bicycles, a set of all bricks, every separate set. So there's a boundary around them. Um, and, and then you can sort of, when you put them all together, you can think of the set, the set of everything, the set of all entities, which in itself has a boundary around it. And um, so the question is, because in any boundaries, there's a sort of boundary between one thing and another, by definition, well, what's the other side of it? Uh, and this is where the, the, the boundary becomes unstable, is the boundary itself, is it outside the set of all things? If it's a thing, shouldn't it be inside the, the set? The boundary itself is a, an entity. Uh, sort of both inside and outside at the same time. It's a genuine contradiction. This is why he thinks he's got a sort of formal logical uh, explanation, at least support for, for, for Hegel's account of possibility of real contradictions that then move the world forward as in the uh, formula of commentators, the thesis and antithesis in contradiction with each other, and the synthesis can result. Um, 
So uh, what happens is the, the boundary becomes torn. It's, it's sort of, it's no longer a boundary. Uh, and uh, then it allows things that are, are outside, if there are anything outside the this set of all things, uh, to be to be sensed and spotted and then understood and brought in into the, the now the enlarged set of all entities. Um, so this this is uh, this is a way to explain. I think a good way to explain uh, Kant's phenomenon versus noumenon distinction: the, the phenomena inside, but there's a noumenon outside, and what's outside can be brought in once we discover it and come to know it. So um, the, to sort of summarise my, my whole talk, then um, then overall, uh, you know, I exist. I, I have I have being and parts to my being. We all exist uh, in our own way. All, all the things in the universe exist in different ways. Uh, but what I know about each one of them is a separate matter. Uh, respect to just this final part and um, and discovery, then uh, the, the the tacit you know, hidden quality of of um, the object that's that's just outside the the boundary of what we know um, is not is not a question of the ontology of that thing. It, it may be mysterious because we don't know what it is yet. Um, but that's that's not its essential quality. Um, uh, and, and the knowledge itself isn't a, a separate entity in its own right. It's you know, we, we to have knowledge, you have to have knowers. It depends on us. Um, and it's about our status as knowing that thing or, or not knowing that thing in turn. So that, that that's where I I end my talk. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, okay, uh, I think we can now um, open open the floor uh, for the discussions. Uh, I, I have some questions of my own, but um, maybe um, someone would like to to start. So, uh, if if anyone has has anything to add or um, would like to ask Martin a question, uh, I would like to ask you to to use the uh, up button, raise your hand, or just um, straight up, you know, uh, turn on the microphone and uh, speak. Okay, I, I see that Carola is here with us and she has a question. So Carola, please uh, feel free to join us. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I come actually from arts um, world, so it's a really nice thing to see that it's being brought into that. Although I have to say George Dickey's uh, definition is quite restrictive from our perspective, you know, but um, uh, so I was actually surprised that it's quite recent. Um, but my question is rather about this notion of tacit being always hidden or secret. And we have in the arts world, something that we have defined as embodied knowledge. And the piano playing is such a great uh, example. So it might actually start off as explicit knowledge that one can define and um, uh, uh, make explicit in words, uh, but it can end up as as a hidden knowledge that is completely embodied. And I think there's a differentiation between possibly, you know, different kinds of tacit knowledge. Uh, uh, certainly from my perspective, that embodied knowledge is a category that specifically, of course, is important for the arts, but that, that is quite different than the tacit knowledge um, that is sometimes defined by the authors that that you've um, you know put forward. So, so that's what I just wanted to sort of explore and what you think about that. But I'll make a comment about uh, yeah, George Dickey first of all. Yes, and, and uh, I don't I don't think he's got got the best um, theory of definition of art either. But yes, I think I think it's actually useful for looking at um, what do we mean by academic practice. That's 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 how I used it in in what I've, something I've written before. Um, and I'll just use the illustration of, of, uh, of how you know higher levels of uh, of human input can may still be needed to make things what they are, um, and not just about art. Um, it applies to other things too. But yes, so mm -hmm. but, 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 uh, I'm happy for you not to <laughs> be, be a fan of his for just talking about art and not not, not the best explanation for art. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, so. Uh, yeah, so with with well, which which one do you look at? You look at piano playing. Uh, um, yeah, the, the yeah. notion of embodied knowledge. So so I think that yeah. the thing that I struck upon is, um, and I might not have understood it right, but that quite often tacit knowledge is actually associated with being secret or invisible, and um, I think there needs to be a differentiation made. So whether embodied knowledge is a subset of tacit knowledge or embodied knowledge is something uniquely different. 
Um, and of course, you know, we get that all the time. You know, we have dance practitioners who do research and have to define what new knowledge in the dance practices. Um, and so there's a lot of embodied knowledge within that. Um, and of course, when doing research, it has to be made explicit. But um, so, so we encounter that again and again and again. And I feel it's a different category than the usual tacit knowledges. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's more of a sort of common, isn't it? Uh, but but yes, it's useful to, um, for for me at least, to to, to link back to what Polanyi says about a lot of different activities and it, his examples. Uh, um, two big examples of uh, wine tasting and medical diagnostics, but they also in in other parts of uh, his his explanation of what's going on. He talks about piano playing, as, as I mentioned, um, and. Uh, what he says well, when you're when you're learning things this is the, the learning how to do something to, to know it versus knowing it already and doing it um uh which is is often missed out in discussions of tacit knowledge that that's my point there um so uh but for some things you, to learn them effectively then you you just being told you know it's something you could pick up a book and, and just read to have your explanation won't get you there you have to be shown it so this is um with, with uh, you know, if you're playing a piano, I'm, I'm not a, much of a piano player. I play the guitar a bit, but it's um, if you if you're trying to teach someone how to do it, then then you'll be showing showing them where to put their fingers. Yeah, when they're they're, they're, real, they're putting a real novice, <laughs> then then you have to you know take it slowly, one thing at a time, uh, until they you know they can start to remember what to do, and and they don't have to think about it. Um. But uh, you, you probably use some words. There'll be some discursive element of it, but it's um, showing, which is the main thing, uh, and and that's that's tacit in the sense of of not using words where it is just mm. showing. But it's explicit in the sense of focus your attention on this, will you? Um, and so that is is, is that different? That, that those two distinctions in in plan are absolutely key to, and, and are often forgotten if, mm. if ever noted in the first place. Um, so it's it's the, the explicit in the sense of where's your focus of attention, and it, it your focus of attention shifts. So um, another example, if I can, you know, it, it talk about it as, as the arts. If you include literature in the arts, then um, if if you're re reading some words on a page, it doesn't have to be literature, but reading words on a page, then you know if you know how to read, as uh, you, you learn quite quite a young age normally, um, then. Uh, you start to focus on on the you know the the, the units of, of the text in front of you for the meaning of that that unit a block of text um, and you're looking for the meaning there you don't look at the what I'm saying is you know you don't look at the individual letters on the page in themselves uh, and think what's this now but if you're learning a new language particularly it's a different sort of script so, so in, in English writing is one thing there. Uh, Greek is is it's got different symbols, Cyrillic, uh, Chinese. Uh, <clears throat> and then you start to think, you know, look, look at the shape of this thing on the page. And you know, that's the thing you start to focus on. So if you if you if you know English and you're reading a piece of English text, you can do this. You can shift your attention from the meaning of the of the, the text as you're supposed to read it when you can if you're a competent reader to the shape of the individual symbols, the, the letters and the symbols on the page. That's a shift of attention. So what what Pliny says there, and this is one is one of his examples, is that your focus of your attention shifts from one to the other. So what was your focus of attention becomes goes into subsidiary awareness. That's his contrast. It's focal yeah. awareness versus subsidiary awareness, and you can shift back again. Um, so it's a sort of you are aware it's there, but you're not focusing on it, and, and that's a sort of tacit for him as well. So um, that, that's what goes on with with the piano playing. If you, if you competent at it already you focus on the score if you're reading a score or... yeah I think it's an interesting concept you know I, I I sort of question whether it's a shift of focus though in in those processes language is a good one you know there are two ways to learn a language you can learn it by rote you know normally just as as we normally do a foreign language or you can immerse yourself and of course the linguistics um uh, sector then basically says you don't learn a language, you acquire a language. So, so the cognitive patterns, you know, that the process of learning is a different one than based on rationality, based on um, uh, logic. Um, and I think that uh, has something, you know, there, there are some, some uh, interesting, intriguing differences in terms of what that means for 
tacitness and um, how we acquire knowledge or, or how we produce new knowledge. Um, I th yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, so the, I mean, the other thing about, yes, the uh, what, what you don't say, um, but you sort of still know, um, you can still, at least in, in reflection, or, you know, afterwards, you can still sort of find uh, some account of linguistic account to, to to describe and it may enlighten what you're doing so if you're yes, so doing a phd in dance you do the dance which may which will typically won't be linguistic but you can still write about it and that that can illuminate things about it yeah. but it's not even though it's not doing the dance yeah thank you um, all right, so we have two questions, one from Soren and one from Iris, but there is also a question in the chat uh, from um, Maria Jakubik. So uh, maybe before we ask uh, Iris and Soren to join us, I I'll briefly um, read the, the question from the chat. Um, so the stratified ontology of critical realism has the empirical, actual and real ontological layers. Do you consider explicit knowledge, codified knowledge as empirical knowing as actual and tacit knowledge as real. The thing is that tacit knowledge can be embodied tacit knowledge and not yet embodied tacit knowledge. I think that explicit knowledge is empirical knowledge. Tacit embodied knowledge is actual and tacit not yet embodied knowledge is real knowledge. Uh, could you could you try to relate uh, to the to the question to the um, to the comment from from chat Martin? Well there's also a bit more there about um about uh Lanny as well um yeah yeah uh i mean i i, I mentioned roy baskar um and I, I haven't talked about critical realism as such and i, I suppose that the um how it, how it fits into the picture if, if um perhaps um uh no no um I was wondering where to get up one of my slides again, but 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 if, if uh, I'll just describe it, if think about um, my spectrum of realism to anti-realism, that's the things that can be at least un, in, known uh, or described at least uh, um, relatively independent of us. That's the more realist versus the descriptions of them variously that are more, more dependent on us and have more human input to make them what they are. That's the anti-realist end of the spectrum. Then um, the, the critical realist sort of it's more of a sort of an approach to uh, investigating any object on any of point on that scale, sort of coming in from the side, as it were, of what's otherwise a linear spectrum um, to reveal what's what's going on. So it, 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 the object could already be described in, in very anti-realist terms, but there could still be something. Um, that's sort of misrepresented, which a critical realist approach could could uncover as what's really going on underneath it. Uh, so um, any any account of an object can be can be can be approached that way, with the critical realist way, however anti-real it, it already is. Um, but uh, the the, I mean, the other categories from Basker, I'm, I'm, I haven't really tried to incorporate find a place in, in this talk so um is it, is it empirical knowledge i mean that, that that seems straightforward to me uh empirical knowledge is what knowledge we acquire by by um you know observing observing uh, collecting data about it so I mean, we need our five senses but also maybe some other refining processes such as uh, come through one method or another, um, but uh, empirical knowledge. I'd, I'd, I'd contrast with, um, with uh, I suppose, n necessarily true knowledge or analytic knowledge. For example, where things are true by definition of the terms, and it's a sort of version of analytic knowledge. Uh, and so, uh, I'm not trying to say one's tacit or one's explicit. I guess they both can be both <laughs> if, if, if that's getting at this this question um mm -hmm. oh, it's a bit more about Polanyi. um I think it's right that um the the tacit and the the explicit 
aspects to knowing could apply both to practical knowledge and to theoretical knowledge. So a, that, he does say that, and, and so do I, if that sort of covers the other bit. So I hope I've dealt with that. Um, yeah. If, uh, yeah, we, we, we have okay. also Iris with us uh, who, who raised her hand. So Iris, could you, could you join us? Yeah, thanks, Martin, for this presentation. Um, so I have a question that actually, I guess, relates to Corolla's and Maria's question between um, the implications of sort of this distinguishing between propositional knowledge and tacit knowledge. Because it seems to me in the university, we seem to value propositional knowledge over tacit knowledge. For example, if you think about how students are, are taught things, but also how students are tested. So I wonder if you, what your thoughts are on this? Is this a good thing? Should we maybe value tacit knowledge more? And if so, how? And the other uh, question I had is maybe a little bit of a, a, a broader um, question about epistemology, because it seemed to me that your presentation was very focused on individuals learning in isolation. Uh, and maybe, I, I mean, you have to choose a focus of where you're you're going to introduce epistemology as opposed to ontology. Um, but I think that in the university, you learn in, a, yeah, you don't learn in isolation. You don't do research in isolation. So maybe I'd like to hear some thoughts um, from you on that. Um, so thanks. Certainly, yes, there's at least two things there, isn't there? I'll, I'll deal with the first one first, which is, you know, I think, to rephrase it, it should be value, or should be recognized. Um, the tacit, well, tacit learning as well. It's not a phrase that plenty use, but plenty use. But when you're learning it, is it, is it, are you doing it? And do you know you're doing it at the time, knowing you, what you're learning at the time when you're learning it, or uh, are you using any words when you're when you're acquiring the the knowledge? And um, so it should be recognised that a lot of that's going on in university learning, not just in. Um, or in art subjects, university subjects too, but uh, uh, also vocational learning that may be recognised more, um, whether it's understood more is another matter. Uh, so I suppose one of the reasons it's not talked about much is because it's tacit, it's like sort of, so you, can't, you can't talk about it too much, uh, um, and you, you can ultimately, theoretically speaking, but when it's happening, um, if it's not using words, when you, you're learning tacitly, then uh, that's why it appears not to be being recognised, I suppose. Uh, so, but, but yes, uh, in, in, in reflective documents afterwards, we, we can bring this out more. So, so yes, in answer to that question. And um, it reminds me of, uh, it was actually a, a, a talk I went to at a conference, uh, it's over 20 years ago now, but it was a, an academic, um, two academics uh, from the same institution, but one taught dance and, and was a supervisor and examiner of dance PhDs, and the other was a, a chemistry lecturer and um, supervisor and examiner of chemistry PhDs. And they they they, they stood up together and um, said, "We're we're basically doing the same sort of thing um, in that um, what, what what you know to be a competent chemist and and uh, and do the right things and and make discoveries in chemistry. That then um, it, a lot of it's an activity and and um, yeah, the the writing up of of a chemistry PhD thesis is 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 uh, often something that's sort of done after the activity. Um, and so my PhD was in philosophy, and and the writing is the activity, reading and writing, much more. Uh, but in in lab based subjects, then yes, they may be making some lab notes, but uh, a lot of it isn't uh, about the writing. Uh, and the, the chemistry lecture wondered, you know, should we have a PhD more like a dance PhD, where your your your, your activity of being a chemist, the the actions, your your, your bodily behaviour, should be being examined as well. Um, and I think, I'm not sure it's going to happen because it, it require a lot more uh, resource to do so. But it, it is a major question. You know, when you got the the dissertation in front of you, which is words and formulae and so on, diagrams and whatever, then. Does that catch what's really happened when you're you know, you're um, contributing to knowledge in chemistry? And his answer was no. Um, in, you know, the chemist himself. So uh, yes, people have already asked this question: Should we be, be valuing more the, uh, the the things that aren't written uh, and, and maybe not necessarily noticed even at the time? 
Um, so, uh, and, and the, sorry, the, the other part of your question was was more about um, uh, collective knowing. Is that right or on individual? Uh, I think it's right. Not necessarily so, collective yeah. knowing. It doesn't right. have to be collective yeah. knowing. But I, I just the the artists that you drew on. I feel like they talk about knowing in isolation as sort of this individual person attaining knowledge from something somewhere. But in in real life, of course, that's usually not how it works. There is a whole social environment that interacts with with people. And um, I mean, it's it's your scope of focus of epistemology. But I feel if you want to make implications about what it means for the university, this social element is also very important. Yeah, that's what they call it the the methodology of learning or you know, teaching methodology. Even if you, you know, we we undergraduate education, we we, we teach groups of students. You know, it's got, it's got to be a, um, an element of social learning, uh, the process of becoming to learn. But it, and what probably happens is that each individual student has that slightly different understanding uh, of, of what they're supposed to understand. And maybe that doesn't matter, um, although. The, students can get it wrong um and they they, they, get, they get found out when they get assessed um but um yes how they learn is you know if you've got those influences and then you can yes it's taking this further than if you sort of break your class up into smaller groups then each group will be having a different experience and sort of what they're learning as that small group will be different slightly different from what the next small group would be learning because you know, they're not, they're not identical and say all and do all the same things so um but, but ultimately it's a, the i know it's a, because we we assess most of our assessment practices is, is to take the individual well, what what do you know now <laughs> what have you learned and assess them individually then it, it also must be so that each individual will have their own knowledge whether it's all the knowledge you want them to have or not um so there's always that individual level of knowledge of knowing all right um any further questions uh is there someone who would like to add something we still have a few minutes so there is there is time for one more uh okay uh we have one question from cecile so uh, if you would like to join us please do so yes Hi, um, thank you very much for a very nice uh, talk. Um, I'm um, at University of Bergen, for those of you who I don't know. Um, I was wondering about, um, so because we, the last question was a little bit more on method, I would say. So I was wondering, how do we get knowledge or scientific knowledge? about phenomenons then uh, what kind of methods can we use um to do, do how how do we talk to people do we observe people how how can we get knowledge about tacit knowledge that's an interesting question yes i think it may be uh yes um the link back to iris's question about about sort of social learning as, as, as a sort of method of learning as well um and and there are, there are methods and there are other methods <laughs> uh, uh so it could be quite a long list i could i could sort of say describe how, how we how we come to learn things so le le learning things is is uh and, 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 and with with plato's um paradox of learning in the amino then that's the individual level learning it's the the slave boy learning or coming to know more clearly um was was planning more interested in 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 the, the the whole um scope of human knowledge how can we what we've got so far how can we discover anything new if we if we haven't discovered it already how do we know it's there in the first place but that's this version of the, of the of the paradox um but uh with, with certainly with science and um and and uh phrase we we see a lot and hear about discussion of sciences and by policy makers as well is is the the scientific method um and um 
it's it's a sort of the you know, the gold standard of of how to go about things but there, there isn't one scientific method <laughs> there's this, just many many different ones um according to the context according to the discipline just to give an example then um the, the sort of gold standard the, the one that policymakers like and think should apply to social science and education as well is is, is the medical model of uh randomized control trials mm -hmm. um and uh yes yeah, so it is a pretty rigorous method uh for which is useful in certain contexts such as trialing a drug um that can be consumed somehow by by humans but uh and then you you go to one of the other paradigm scientific subjects like 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 um physics particularly astrophysics uh and and subatomic physics what are they doing there they're, they're not i haven't got a randomized control trial it's a they use statistics a lot but um they're doing something completely different there uh, discovery of the higgs boson or gravitational waves um you know, those, those are sort of big discoveries that um that uh but you know the Lanny wasn't around to confirm their discoveries but sort of things they had in mind he was a physical chemist himself originally Michael Polanyi um and turned to uh education as a as a, as a main subject to, subsequently to that um so uh you, you just sort of do different you, you discover things in different ways and um that's part, part, it's part, part of your question I'm thinking this at the moment also that that uh you know the method you choose will in the large part determine what you discover I think mm -hmm. I think that's true <laughs> um so yes there's even though you know gravitational waves sort of exist independently of us that's the sort of picture that astrophysics wants to give us um it's their their approach their, their initial theorization which they then go out to try and confirm empirically um sets up the, a, a problem in the first place which so they wouldn't have discovered them if they hadn't set up the problem in that way and gone about it using that certain method that that, that is true yes but, so there's always something of us in anything we know as in what it is there's something of us in what it is and so nothing's fully just realist truth there's a bit of anti-realist truth in everything because we're involved somehow I think that's right um but um how it's then then constituted uh even though it's constituted partly by us as as, as anti-realist then that's then established uh and can be challenged uh, as maybe not true but um established as for the sake of argument true then there's a question uh everybody else coming along and coming to learn it they didn't know it beforehand when they come to know it so their knowledge um they're coming to know it is, is separate from the fact of what it is and that's my main point so uh, I, I see that Carol also has a uh, hand up so just just briefly all right because we have to uh be finishing shortly so so final remarks <laughs> sorry yes now a really intriguing um discussion uh just wanted to point to Robin Nelson's book of practices research of course because he deals with specifically also the the tacit in the arts and stuff like that and he he leans on some of the works that you mentioned Martin you know he does have the know-how the insider close-up knowledge um or knowing experiential haptic performative tacit embodied and then he has of course know what the tacit made explicit through critical reflection knowing knowing what works what composition you know, um structures and then it's this rather outside Outside of knowing what you know the spectator studies and stuff like that but one of the things that I'm continually thinking about and of course there's still a sort of debate in in the UK about practice as research you know what is valid what is not uh, but for me there's a real differentiation between learning on the one hand knowledge and research on the other and of course this notion of that research needs an explicit making of the new knowledge that is produced so it doesn't lie, for instance, in the art, in the artwork per se, it lies in the process of making the art. Um, so there are these differentiations um, in relation to that. Having said that, 
there are compositional PhDs where you have to only write 500 words and you know some old universities have PhDs by composition hmm. where the inherent sort of uh, uh, gist of that is the inherent sort of uh, ideology is that knowledge is inherent in the artwork even if it's not made explicit by words but that's the debate does research have to include an explicit making in words in some form or manner it doesn't have to be written words it can be documentary that is referenced but it's the question of does it have to be made explicit by words in order for us to understand it as valid research and that's sort of tightly sort of uh, you know tied into the questions that you're looking at, at martin isn't it in terms of you know this no notion of um uh the different forms of knowledge and what that means for universities yes yes interesting uh um very interesting question and then this the what 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 does the new thing consist in i this is the main question i'm getting out of it uh, um so yes uh, uh researchers practice then in, in, to be researching you and this is the example where i mentioned chemistry as well the, the activity of doing it and there's an activity involved in, in researching any subject even more more discursive subjects like uh, the humanities but um uh it, what I would say is yes, uh, to get a doctorate in it, then there has to be some words. <laughs> I think I would stick with that. Um, you have to have some sort of dissertation element to give some explanation of what you're doing in, in words. And you, you'll have some sort of interaction verbally as well with the viva. You know, you have to demonstrate the dance, for example, somehow um, show the artwork. Uh, but um, you have to talk about it as well. So yeah. that, that's, that's discursive linguistic um and that's the true of, of any viva in any subject so um but 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 doing the research you, you can be making something new without using the words I mean, that, that's that's certainly practices research practice <laughs> research practice is, is practice um in any subject mm. and so uh yes and your contribution itself your contribution to knowledge it doesn't have to be in propositional form that's, that's my view anyway so, right yeah so this applies also to in, innovations and it just you know, technological innovations as well and one more thing about so the last part of my talk about the um you know what, what's beyond the boundary of the set of all things and it doesn't just apply to this uh, no coming to know a new entity that exists um uh, and then being able to describe it in propositional terms but um it could just could apply to knowing how as well knowing how to do something new that no one's done before um so that'd be a contribution hmm. uh, it's not just uh, uh propositional knowledge but, but knowing how as well and and um and, and technological innovations are things that um haven't been imagined before we we, we you know, icarus um stuck stuck birds feathers on his arms and got too close to the sun the sun melted the wax and so he fell so he started to fly but didn't quite succeed to fly hmm. but the idea of flying as a technological innovation you know so it's gone back as old as that but other things you know weren't even th thought of that, that had been invented since the ancient Greeks um and um they're, they're you know at the time they were outside that boundary and now they're inside it so it applies to technological innovations as well yeah thank you all right uh thank you very much for today's uh, discussion Martin thank you once again for accepting our invitation it was a great pleasure to to having you here with us just just as very short um, an, uh, announcement. Uh, we will be back in March. In March, uh, we will have Fadia Daki with us. Um, she will have a quite different angle to to, to her talk, as as she will concentrate uh, on on her main topic, that is rhythmos um, in the context of university um, ontology. Um, so quite a different take, but still, um, I will. I, I hope that um, you will join us again, and uh, we will continue our conversation even if uh, there will be slight um, yeah, change of scope through which uh, we um, uh, try to wrestle with the uh, question of university and ontology so once again thank you very much for today thank you martin hope to see you again uh, in a in a bit in march thank you very much well, thank you thank you to everybody yes very interesting for me as well thank you <laughs>